Did the Nazi party, did Hitler, come to power legally? The answer to this is often said, yes. But there are a number of good reasons to doubt. It's very important to remember the extreme violence that flourished in the streets of Germany in the years from 1918 to 21 to begin with. There's an uprising of the communists, the Spartacus revolution, a counter-revolution in Munich, the Kapp Putsch in 1920, tanks on the streets, armed units rushing around Berlin, the Freikorps, the Free Corps, a lot of freebooters, ex-soldiers. All of this uh, created an atmosphere of violent instability, almost civil war between 1918 and 21. And then 1923, the Beer Hall Putsch, Hitler's attempt to seize power in Munich by force and then march on Berlin. This is, of course, modelled on Mussolini's march on Rome uh, in 1922, and a lot of early Nazism was an imitation of Mussolini's fascist movement in Italy. The threat of force had made the Italian king appoint Mussolini as the leader of a fascist government. But Mussolini in Italy had taken over already a lot of North Italian towns by force, and he enjoyed support in the Italian political elite. Hitler was defeated in 1923 because he was not supported by the army or the police or industry or politicians in Munich, let alone the rest of the country. In 1933, he made sure he secured their support. And, of course, he resolved in 1923, after the defeat of the Beer Hall Putsch, that he would try and achieve power by winning votes. You couldn't do it by force, he thought. But that didn't mean that he didn't use force. This is a post-World War I Germany. It's a violent, militarised society. Every party had its own paramilitary movement. The Red Front Fighters League, for example, with the Communists. The Reichsbanner Black, Red and Gold of the Social Democrats. The Steel Helmets League of Front Soldiers for the Nationalists and so on. It was just a part of everyday life on the streets of Berlin and Hamburg and Munich and other cities that you'd see groups of uniformed paramilitaries marching around and attacking other paramilitary groups uh, of different parties. Just a few statistics that show this. In 1930, 44 communists were killed in clashes with Nazis. 17 Nazis were killed in clashes with communists. 52 communists killed in 19, uh, the elections of 1932, the first seven weeks of the July 1932 election campaign. There were political riots all over Prussia. So political violence was endemic in the Weimar Republic and got worse and worse. In the first six months of 1933, when Hitler was in charge of the government but not fully in power. Acts of violence by Nazis against their political opponents, including in concentration camps they set up in March and after that, gave rise to thousands of prosecutions by the existing legal system, which were later quashed, stopped by, by Hitler. The SA, the stormtroopers of the Nazis, their paramilitaries, were enrolled as police auxiliaries by Goering, but this did not, of course, make murder, theft and torture legal. Murder committed by a policeman is still murder. What Hitler was trying to do was to preserve the appearance of legality in the midst of all this mayhem. Propaganda was central to the Nazis winning votes and support, but also violence and intimidation were a central part of the Nazi seizure of power. The threat of violence, threat of civil war, intimidated the nationalists and other parties into dissolving themselves and played a key role in persuading the army to agree to Hitler's appointment as Reich Chancellor. The Reichstag fire, the Enabling Act, civil service law of the 7th of April 1933, which banned political opponents as well as Jews from holding 
public office or occupying positions in the civil service and the state administration, those are all pseudo-legal justifications for dictatorship. Alongside all of this massive violence on the streets, creation of concentration camps, at least 600 deaths officially recorded in the first six months of 1933 of opponents of the Nazis. Alongside all of this, there were, of course, these legal justifications for dictatorial power. But those legal justifications were themselves not strictly legal. The Enabling Act, the 23rd of March 1933, which gave power to Hitler and the cabinet to make laws on their own, without referring to the president or the Reichstag, was only passed because the communist deputies who were elected despite severe oppression on the 5th of March were not allowed to take their seats in the Reichstag. There was no law banning them. They had just been arrested and expelled and prevented from entering. And then Hermann Goering, one of the leading Nazis, was appointed minister-president, head of the government of Prussia, the state that covered the larger part of Germany, uh, in uh, 1932 uh, to three. He held office as minister-president of, of Prussia, but of course the legitimate elected government of Prussia, the Social Democrats, had been deposed illegally by von Papen in 1932. And the German Supreme Court rather late in the day, too late to do anything about it, ruled key aspects of Papen's deposition of the Prussian government in July 1932 to be illegal. So even in a technical sense, a lot of things that Nazis did in 1933 were not legal at all. They pursued a kind of twin-track approach. Consent, willing or reluctant, sometimes under threats and blackmail from the old elites and the nationalists, uh, was achieved with this undercurrent of violence, pseudo-legal justifications like the Enabling Act and mass violence underpinning it all. The concentration camps for socialists and communists were set up with the reassurances to the old elites that order would be restored. So the Nazis did not sweep to power on a tidal wave of popular support. In fact, they never got more than 37% in a free election. That seemed to have been the limit of their electoral power. Even in March 1933, when opposition parties were prevented from participating, campaigning, they only got 44%. The Communists and the Social Democrats actually won more votes in November 1932 between them than the Nazis did. They were bitterly opposed to each other. They could not unite in opposition to the Nazis. Germans were divided, therefore, in their opposition to Nazism. They were intimidated by violence. And also, they were used to violence on the streets, to paramilitaries marching everywhere, and saw nothing particularly unusual in it. Germans who opposed Nazism or did not support it were in fact majority, but they weren't sufficiently committed to the Weimar Republic to defend it, and perhaps they were not vigilant enough in defence of their liberties. Maybe this is a lesson for today.